Okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. I've got my oscillating drum sander. Now, yeah, I got a big one, stationary mount. But a small one, the little small ones work just fine. Uh, I've actually used that um, drum sander on a drill press, you know. But these are nice and do a, a quick job. So let's take, in this case, all I'm going to do is sand it to the line. Oscillating drum sander, the little vertical deal, does extremely well. And you also notice where I had my little oops. Well, that was because I got a chip under here and I kind of twist it. Actually, I twist it back this way. Make sure you're comfortable and make sure you're able to have a nice surface that you can stay flat on. All right, normally I kind of run from the other direction where I've got more surface, but it's kind of hard to do and show you. But here's another trick. You know, a lot of guys don't even realize that you can change bearings on routers bits. So here, here, and I'm a firm believer in my little cliche of sneak up on it. It just works, guys. It just flat works. You know, ease into your cuts. Don't get so aggressive. Now, what else I could have done, in the case of the half inch spiral, I could have put on a 9 16 bearing which would have made my made me cut a sixteenth of an inch larger instead of being a pure flush. Do the same thing with the down sh with, with you know with this bit. What that allows me to do is overcut, come back, come change the bearing back to the flush, and I'm taking very small passes as I do. So so by using a bearing a little larger bearing stepping down to the final size, I'm able to take small cuts. Therefore, my chances of chip out, tear out, or being too aggressive is dramatically reduced. It's safer, you're going to get smoother cuts and nicer cuts. Give it a thought. Okay, what I'm going to do next is I'm actually just going to clamp these together. And then I'm going to take my random orbit sander 
and I'm going to sand them together as a unit just to smooth everything up, make sure this outer edge is really nice and smooth. Now you notice when we were using the, the drum sander that one of the things that we did where we had the oops, we blended it out. Okay, and blending something when you're sanding, if you've got a defect here, it's going to amount to you coming from this, both directions to gently blend it. Don't try to, if you stay in a confined area, you're going to make a big dip. If you gently blend it, you fool the eye. The eye never sees it. It goes away. It disappears. It's just the way it works. Okay, I'm going to finish tweaking these up, take the random orbit sander, clean them up. And we're going to be really ready to cut our cross pieces and uh, get them together. I've sanded on the drum, oscillating drum sander. Got everything pretty nice. Now I've clamped them together. You know, I'm not as worried about each one of these uprights being exactly the same as I am that they flow nice. That everything has a nice flow to it. We don't have any bumps or lumps or anything like that. That when you look at it, everything flows well. You know, it's like a cabriolet leg. The flow of the leg and not having lumps and bumps and everything just flowing together, believe it or not, is far more important than each one being exactly the same. You know, I tell students all the time, there's a little rule. And the rule is, is if they look the same, they are the same. You know, if there's a little slight deviation in the size of these from one side to the other, you're never going to see it. And it's handcrafted. You know, if it was per absolutely perfect, and we all want that, but if it was, well, then odds are it wasn't really made by a human, because we're not perfect. So get it good, get it nice and get on. Now I've got them clamped together, a little scraping, sand them up through to some 220, I'm good to go. You know, make sure that everything is nice and rounded and whatever. Then when we're done with this, then it's going to be time to come back and slightly round them over. And we'll do that. Then we're going to drill our mortises and we're going to make our cross pieces and get, put them in. We put it, then we're done building. Now this is the poplar set and remember I had the oops that I had to blend out. Well I did nice because I don't know exactly where I did it at. Yeah it's right here. You can see because this was blended so gently. We can see it here, but what I'll do is take my scraper and sander and I'll blend this one to match. Not that I have to, but it's just such a gradual thing that it completely removed it and it's, you know what, six months from now, you're not even gonna know you did it. If you're like me, and if you're like me, you might not remember it six days from now. As long as you've got that nice flow, you're okay. Everything is good. Okay, a little bit of scraping, a little bit of sanding, and we're going to be ready to go. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about shaping the post. If you don't have an oscillating drum sander or a drum sander, to bandsaw them close to the line, clamp them up just like this, and to take your random orbit, and start with an 80 and move on up progressively through the grits to shape your post works great. You know, to also take a nice rasp, a good rasp, rasp them to get everything nice and close to the shape you want, then take your random orbit and clean them up and sand them up. Works just fine. It works just fine. It doesn't take a lot of fancy tools. They're nice. It doesn't take a lot of fancy tools to create something. Okay, I'm gonna clean them up, sand them up. We come back, we'll round over them and get our cross pieces in.
here's what we're going to do. I know I said that I was going to round them over and drill the holes and all that. We'll do that in a little bit. What I want to do first is I want to get the, crop, the dividers, horizontal members cut. Now on the original, the piece was just a little under seven eighths wide and an inch and an eighth tall this way. Now, one of the things we did is that we kind of like the round look a little better. The other thing we did is we, because of the modern day bedding, we stretched it out. So our distance from this point to this point is 36 inches. And then we've got our tenons to go on there. So what I've done is I took a piece of cherry and some poplar and I rough cut it to 38 inches. Now, what I'm using is some four quarter but it's a heavy four quarter. And that means, you know, sometimes when you buy four quarter lumber and it's rough, it's gonna come in about inch and 16th to an inch and an eighth. This is actually a strong inch and an eighth and it was just some cherry I had. And kind of the same thing with the poplar. The poplar is a little bit thinner, but I looked for something that was as straight as I could get it. Cause we are gonna have, I want this, this is the one I make. And I actually use a round tenon instead of the square. And I try and I round it up. Now, you're gonna ask, can, well, can I buy a dowel and do it? Sure, works great if you can find one straight. So that's the key is getting, the, getting it straight. And that's what we're gonna look at. Now, the other thing, the change we made is that we brought the bottom stretcher up. Remember on the original they actually used, it was a peg, they actually used a through tenon, wedged it, and that held the mortise and the bottom support. I really didn't care for that for two reasons. One, I didn't like how low it set to the floor. The second thing is we also made ours taller. And I didn't like the cross member being down, the stretcher being down here because it made this distance look so great. Plus, it also made a little bit more rack ability to it. So that being the case, I raised it up, just using a round tenon like we're gonna do. It made for a quick, easy assembly. And that's an important thing, being able to get them done, especially when you make a living doing it. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cut the stock that we're going to get our stretchers out of. Now, one of the things you want to pay attention to is we want to use as close as we can what we, what's quarter sawn stock. Now, the way you can identify quarter sawn, this is, this is flat. But if you look at the growth rings here going this way, just like a two by four that you're building with or like a floor joist or anything, you want the grain to run vertical. In other words, you want it running up and down. And the reason for that is that's just like turning that two by four or two by six or two by eight on edge. It's a lot stronger that way. Okay, and it's gonna bear weight better. It's, that's the least flexible area. Now I'm showing you that now so that we can get a close up of it so we know what we're doing. So when I put this in, I want my grain running this way. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm, this has actually been planed a little bit. My poplar has not. And the reason for that is, is I've joined it one edge. The reason is, is that for me to get a seven eighths and what I'm, and this piece is gonna be seven eighths by seven eighths. In order for me to get that, I don't have much room to play. I'm actually, I'm actually an inch and an eighth, so I'm, I ain't got a lot of play room there. And that said, if you're not aware, and I feel sure you are, when you cut something, one of the biggest mistakes I see made is when you're using a wider piece of wood and you want something that's kind of thin or narrow, is just watch guys just rip it. And you see it come off the table saw and you're gonna see it do this or try to pinch. 
Now pinching, that's where a good splitter, riving knife is a really important thing to have for safety. So what I always, always do, again, goes back to my little saying, sneak up on it. I never, I never rip to width, particularly on something small, right out of the gate. Because if it moves, what do I do then? So what I always do is I always overcut, then I come back and ease in to the final cut. Makes sense and it works. Okay, I'm gonna cut these at an inch and a quarter just to give me room to clean up. I could probably get by at an inch and an eighth, but I wanna be sure. Okay, I've cut four of the poplar. The reason being is that just like we did with the mortises, I mean the tenons on the, on the base or on the uprights, I want something to give me a setup. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come back and I'm going to start trimming these up, get them nice and straight. I can put one edge across the joiner if I wanted to and joint two edges then come back and ease in till I get my seven eighths thickness. So that's what we're gonna do. Then we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at rounding them over and we're gonna look at making the tenons. Here's what I've done. I actually wound up ripping all of my cross pieces. I ripped them to about 15 sixteenths, maybe even a little hair strong. Then I put them through the drum sander on 180 to clean them up and to make sure that they were dead straight. And as you can see, they are. Now, if you notice when I was ripping them, I was getting some burning. You know, the black streaks in the wood. All right, one of the things, I haven't changed my blade in a little bit, and it's still good and sharp. But if you look around here on these teeth, you're gonna see a whole lot of resin deposit. Now, what I need to do is to, what I haven't done in a little bit is clean my blade. And all that resin deposit on there causes burns. A dull blade will do it too, as well as a real sl too slow of a feed rate. But keeping that resin off is real important. And if you notice when we was ripping, we were getting it. So keeping your teeth on your blade clean is really important. Okay, now what I'm going to do, I actually, remember I cut these at 38 inches. I went back, chopped them to 37 and a half. I want the inside of this to be 36 inches. So 36 plus two three quarter inch tenons, which is an inch and a half, three quarter plus three quarter. Yeah, that's right. So 37 and a half, 36 plus an inch and a half. So that's what they're cut to. Okay, on only one of them, I'm gonna mark a center. I want, and this is my prototype that I'm gonna use for all my setups. Now we're gonna do a half inch tenon. So what I'm gonna do, mark my center. Now to help me set up, I'm just taking a half inch Forstner bit and I want something that's got a point on it. I can get it in there, right? And I just wanna mark it. Just enough that I can use this when I go to cut my tenons to set my blade height. So that's marked. Now we're ready to route them to as close to a round over as we can get to, a, to round. And we're going to do that right now. To round them over, what I'm going to do is I've got a 3 8 radius round over bit. 3 8 radius with a bearing. Now, on my prototype, just to make sure I'm right, I want to I don't want to get any bottom in this, and I want to hit just about center. 
So what I'm going to do is just hit it this way, this way, this way, and this way, and see what I've got in case I need to adjust my bed a little bit. All right, that looks pretty good. I've turned some of these on a lathe before, and that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. When you're turning something this long, you get a lot of spindle whip and whatever, so, you know, steady rest and all of that. This is just the simplest, easiest way I've ever found to do it. Now, I want to mention one other thing. If you can't come up, if, if your stock won't allow you to get a full 7 8 and you have to go down to a three quarter. I've also done them where I've done them three quarters of an inch by say inch and an eighth. I, d I wouldn't want to use three quarters in something this long. It's just going to be too flexible. But by doing like the original, making it a little longer than it is wider, you're going to come back and get the support that you need. Okay, I'm going to round these up and then we're going to come back and we're going to drill some holes and make some tenons. One of the things I want to talk about is safety and router, table saw, whatever. You know, one of the biggest problems, you know, you see this little disclaimer all the time says, you know, guards and whatever were removed for photographic clarity. Well, it's true. If usually when you've got a cutter completely concealed or whatever, you really can't see what's happening. And so oftentimes we're in a situation where we actually are kind of setting ourselves up for what could be a dangerous situation in order for you to see what we're doing. But that's not an excuse for you not taking proper safety precautions. You know, your safety glasses, hearing, all of that. But just like here, this is the way I normally do these. I have a fence set up. I have, you know, my dust collection set up and I have it shielded. I use a good push stick. And when I'm putting these things through here, I'm coming through, I'm guarded. Once I get go through, then I'm gonna come back with a good push stick and I'm gonna get in here and I'm gonna take it on through. That's the way to do it. See that thing spinning right there? That thing's gonna be spinning anywhere from 10 to 20,000 RPM. It will hurt you. Respect it, be careful. A good fence, now while, even though we were showing you we were using a starter pin, a good fence is the way to do it. Okay, be safe. Don't have any more of that cutter exposed than what you're willing to get cut by. That's just a good way to think of it. All right, I'm going to finish routing these now that I'm set up and be done. I want you to pay real, real close attention here. Okay, so pull your chair up real close and turn the volume up. Now here's what we're doing. We're gonna cut the tenons for our cross pieces. Now, the first thing I did, remember that one that we drilled the little marked center with the half inch bit? Well, here it is. Now what I've got is I put a dado in, five eighths. It's a stack dado set to five eighths of an inch wide, and I've also and I've set the depth to where it's just coming in right at the edge of my tenon. Now, here's the problem. Here's what I want you to understand. Make sure when you're doing this that you don't use your fence number one, because the fence is designed to compensate for the blade on the outside. In other words, the fence is set up for its measurement to be from the inside of this blade to the fence. 
in a dado, it's going to the outside. Now, the other reason I've got a 5 8 I'm cutting a 3 quarter inch long tenon. The reason I've got a 5 8 is I don't want to take all of that off at one shot. I'm much more susceptible to tear out. The other thing I did is I've got an auxiliary fence on my miter slide here to make to give me a little bit of backing. That also helps in the event of tear out. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure, just to be sure, I'm going to measure the three quarters of an inch to the outside tooth of the dado to make sure I'm right. There it is. Okay. Now, here's, what, here's one of the main things I want to show you. I've routed most of these already to my round. And I did that because I knew to show you I was going to have to do it freehand meaning without my fence. The best way to cut it is to do it before you round it, before you round it over and use the fence. Now I'm gonna cut the first one and I'm gonna explain that a little more and make sure you understand why. Now, because this isn't perfectly round, I still have a little bit of a flat surface. And that's what's gonna allow me something to set down tight on my, on my table to cut this. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to back off about an eighth of an inch and make my cuts. Now, once I've done that, now I'm going to the fence. Now, the reason I'm doing that is, again, I don't want to get a tear out in here. I've got a little spot right there. Now that's a result, and that's the problem with dowels too, is that this thing is so close to round is it can want to roll on you. Now that brings up an interesting point. Anything round, if, you, if you're using a chop saw, something round or a band saw, anything, it can try to spin on you, so holding it tightly is a must. Now, a little bit of red you're seeing here, that's just off this dado insert, because it's, I haven't used this one a whole lot. By doing it in the square, it's easy. Here's my consideration, though. If I have to do it freehand, when I come down through here, it's very easy for that router bit to turn right there and take a little bit of that corner off of this face, of this edge right here, which means when I go together, I'm not going to show a tight fit. That's where the fence helps immensely. Once I have made, you know, when it's against the fence on the router bit, it can't turn. It's safer and it makes it easier. And, and going ahead and cutting your tenons in the square is also safer. Now, if you're turning dowels and buying dowels to do this, be very, very careful. Because like I said, this thing is rotating in my direction, the blade, and what it can do is it can try to take that and it can try to spin it. And if you don't have, you know, to set up a clamp system or something would be a good idea because it can rotate that thing and it can, it can catch pretty quick. So be careful.
Now, you see how much easier that was? Whole lot. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and cut the rest of these. Then we're going to find out how to make them fit in a round hole. Round tenons. <laughs> This works. One of the problem areas is going to be right here. You're going to usually leave a little shoulder if you use a rasp, depending upon what kind of rasp you use. But you don't want to get in here and be messing up your, your contact, sh your shoulder here where it contacts. So a lot of times, usually what I'll do is just take a little chisel, come in this way, cut it that way, then clean it off. Now, one of the things I did was I drilled me a hole and a sample, just a scrap, just so I can always check my fit, see what I need to do. Now that's one way you can do it. Takes a little bit of time, but it's, it's very doable. The other thing you can do is make yourself a little shoulder, meaning you want to kind of angle this edge, kind of chamfer it in a little bit, and just using anything. This happens to be a real heavy drill guide. And I can take this and it will actually act as a plane. Now, you probably don't have one of these. You can buy them commercially made or you can actually take just a good steel, a, a little piece of steel with a half inch drill bit and drill it and it works well too. A lot of different ways you can do this. Okay, now, another way to do it is just ch always chamfer this edge a little bit just to make sure that it's slightly smaller than what I want for my next operation. And that is just simply using a half inch tenon cutter. Okay guys, I'm wrapping this thing up. But you know, <clears throat> I thought of something as I was doing these. Back sometime back, we were doing a good many of them, and I had some help. And one of the problems that they had was to be able to rasp this round. Remember when, we, when it was square and when we were setting up our dado, we marked the center and drilled a little mark point, or took the drill and just drilled it to give us a pattern? Now, I've done the same thing here on my tenon. Now, common sense says it would be better to do it while it's square and do all of the ends. And what that does is it's going to give you, it's going to make sure you're in the center, and it's also going to give you a reference. It's going to give you a reference to be able to rasp to so that you know, you know, exactly to get it round so you can start your bit or you know just go ahead and rasp it on out now you know sometimes no matter what you do things go wrong okay what if you just totally blew it you know you've just you're trying to make this tenon and it's just not coming out you know you got a couple options one is you could cut your stretcher down a little bit the other thing you could do would be to simply cut it off and put a dowel in it. Half inch dowel, just drill you a half, you know, keep that center, mark your center, drill you a half inch hole, put your half inch fluted dowel. 
What if you don't have a half inch fluted dowel? Well, if you got a half inch dowel, here's a trick. Take a regular dowel, you could just sand the end a little bit. That provides some glue relief, just taper it a little bit. Simply take yourself a, power a pair of pliers that has the, the grips on them and run up and down it, and this will create the flutes. Why do you need the flutes? The flutes are so when you drive it together that the glue can get past it. Also be careful anytime you're doweling anything, just like we did on the peg. Make sure you've got glue, but you don't want to get too much. If you get too much glue, then you create a hydraulic effect and you can split your wood. So all of that's sad to say there's many, many ways that you can create this little half inch round tenon. Or, you know, you can do like the original and you can chisel out your uprights to a square. Just the way it is. Not difficult at all. Okay, I'm gonna finish this up. As you can see in the background here, I've already got the popular one. I've got it, some clamps on it, dry fitting, came together just fine. I'm gonna finish up the cherry one. And when I'm done, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna round over, we're gonna round over the post. And at that point, it's then ready. No, it's not ready to assemble. It's ready to sand. Because sanding up in here and around these areas is good. You wanna sand the inside of this. You wanna get all of your stretchers sanded nicely before you put it together because they're very they're difficult once it's done this is what we call construction sanding it's the difference when you're a finisher and you understand how hard it is to get in all of these places it doesn't take long to understand it's best done before assembly and that's what we're going to do we'll be back in a bit cherry one's all dry fitted and everything's looking good now I want to round over my uprights. Now this is what I want you to notice. Remember I told you in the beginning that this stretcher actually sets back off center. You can see that a little bit. Now if you choose, you can certainly bring it to the center. Now your pattern is going to be marked for it to, be, to set back a little bit. Why is this an issue? Because Typically, you would round this over with about a quarter inch radius round over bit. But right here, that gets, a real, that gets real close. And the problem is, is if we round that over too much, then what's gonna happen, it's gonna create us a gap right here at this, at this joint. And we don't want that. So here's what I've done. I took a quarter inch radius round over simply because I didn't have a 3 16 And all I did was lower it to round everything over. Now I mark this, I'm gonna set my bit, I set my bit low and I just kept grad and kept touching it until I made sure that I was getting a good round over but that I wasn't going beyond this point. Simple as that. So to re one more time. I used a quarter inch radius round over bit, lowered it so that I didn't round over past this point. Actually I always leave it a little less than that just to give me a little bit of room to sand. Okay, I'm going to round them over. it over. I've already trace coated my popper one and now I'm ready to trace coat cherry one. On the cherry one I've got a couple little pitch pockets right here and here 
and I'm not real thrilled about them. They're not super bad, but I'm going to fill them. Now, oddly enough, what I'm going to do, this is Timbermate. The reason I mention that, it's a water base. I'm actually going to fill these. Normally, you would think you would use a cherry filler. Actually, what I'm going to use is red oak. And the reason I'm using that is because it closely matches the raw wood. And that's exactly what I want. Because the finishing schedule we're going to use, and the fact that this colors real well, will work out quite nicely. Now the final finish on this is what we're going to do is make it look like a natural cherry with the sapwood. And in the little instruction manual, the finishing schedule will be listed. I'm looking it over, just making sure I don't have anything else that's going to create me an issue. If I get a little rough spot. Now I'm going to show you something. Because I was going too fast. This is my fault purely. See right here? I got a little teeny chip right at that intersection. That's a real be easy with that place. So what am I and I got a little place right there. So what am I going to do? I'm going to I don't have a choice. I'm going to fill it. But I also know that this will come out and nobody will ever know it's there. Check it over, make sure I don't have any more pitch pockets or incidences or uglies. We don't like uglies. All right, I think we're in good shape. Yeah, I know you don't shouldn't use fillers, right? Well, sometimes they help us immensely. And what I was explaining was the reason I wouldn't be using a cherry filler is it's dark. It's not. It's real pretty dark. Now I could also intermix them or whatever I want to. Now I'm going to trace coat them. Now those of you who got my finishing DVD, you know exactly why I'm doing this. All this is is a it's a sanding map. Shows me when I'm done sanding. Saves me a lot of time, keeps me from sanding my brains out. Now all I'm going to worry about before assembly is my stretchers and the inside. Anywhere I can't, and in here, anywhere I can't get to easily once it's assembled. And what I'm using is an amber or a yellow for a trace coat, use a water base or an alcohol base. Oil bases have a tendency to not dry real well and they have stains and whatever and they clog up your sandpaper and they don't sand off too hot. And I like a light colored yellow, amber, something of that nature because in the general scheme of the finishing realm it it's not going to conflict with much of anything I put on here. Now I think in my finishing, I'm probably going to go with some gel stains. Once I've got a good uniform base, and I'm probably going to top them off just with a hand wipe gel. Something a good a good gel that's gonna hang with me and do the job. Can't tell you to be that color. I'll just use a clear top coat, or it may be, I'm not sure yet. But make the cherry natural cherry, I'm gonna make the poplar one walnut. Alright. All I gotta do is let these dry and uh
sand them and put them together. I'm all sanded okay, up, guys. sanded everything up to 220, and I'm ready to glue it up. Now, what I've done on my stretchers is I've taken, I put a little bit of tape just for glue squeeze out where I could. Now the other thing I've done, remember we talked about the grain running vertical? That's the way we want it to go in. I've got a piece of tape that's denoting what's going to be top or bottom. Now you can easily tell if you can't see it on the end grain because if you'll notice, I've got a straight grain here. That's the quarter sawn side. On this side, I've got the cathedral grain, or flat sawn. Now, you'll notice that I've made a little bandsaw cut up into my tenon. There's two reasons I do that, and I do this on chairs. Reason one is that little cut is going to give me some glue relief. Now, I never take it all the way. I usually leave it, oh, eighth quarter of an inch from the shoulder. The other thing it does is because this is flat grain and this is flat grain. And when I glue it in, it's, I'm now going to have a flat grain to a flat grain glue point, just like edge gluing. So that's going to give me the strongest bond. If you go back and you look historically and you start dealing with a lot of old antiques and whatever, what's going to ha what you're going to see is most of the time the tenons let go because they shrank. Or just even though this is very narrow and very thin, there's still going to be a little bit of seasonal movement. Now the thing this does inside of there, it will allow this to flex just a little bit and keep these sides in contact. Now this is a minor thing, but if this tenon shrank or this decided to expand any, what would happen is this would allow it to move a little bit. If that little cut wasn't there, then what would happen is if it moved, it's going to break the bond. It has to. Something has to move. And in case you don't know this, the movement of wood is a very powerful force. I don't, you know, when wood decides to expand and contract, a lot of glues will prevent that from happening, and then when that happens, you get cracks and splits and things like that. So you always allow just a little bit. But the biggest thing this does is it adds a little bit of glue relief. The other thing you can do is take yourself a little bit of sandpaper and sand a little chamfer on the end of your tenon. That also allows for a little bit of glue relief. Because we don't want to create a hydraulic effect in here. The other thing is don't over glue it. Now I like to use a little thin, little narrow glue brush, just an acid brush. And if you can't, most of them are 3 8 of an inch or half inch. And if you can't find a narrow one, you can also use a, a cheap, inexpensive artist brush, but just paint it. You've got a good fit here, paint it. That's all you need to do. Now when you glue your tenon, don't get all the way up on the top of it, because as this slides in, it's going to force the, any glue up into it. Again, making sure that your this can be top or bottom and just take it in. That's going to give you a nice joint, good strong joint, and you're not going to have a whole bunch of glue squeeze out because that's not fun to clean up. Now I'm going to proceed on here, get this one glued, and then we're going to clamp it. All right, I'm glued, got my glue in there. Now here's what I'm gonna do. I want me a couple calls on here. This is just some half inch MDF.
Now one of the things you do when you we want to do when you're gluing this up is make sure you've got a good flat surface to set it on. Because you don't have a lot of bracing in here and whatever, you can rack these. So having it sitting on a good sound level surface is the key. Now I'm using a set of parallel clamps and they're really, really nice to do this with. But I want to show you something. When you're clamping this, to clamp this thing good and tight, you know, put a lot of pressure just to make sure your glue, your joints pull tight together. Back off a little bit. Don't put so much pressure that you wind up bowing this. If you do that and you allow the glue to dry, it's going to want to try to stay there. All right, that's about it. Let the glue dry. Now, I like, and this is just me, you see this top where it's bowing? That tells me, I think you can see it, that tells me I got too much pressure. So make sure you're not bowing it. Back off a little bit. Now, again, this just being me, is I like those peg joints. I just, I just do. But I've got a small tenon, and you know, to put a quarter inch peg in it probably would diminish the integrity of the tenon. Additionally, probably wouldn't look too hot. So you know what I'm gonna do? After my glue sets, I'm gonna sneak right here. I'm gonna come in about three eighths. That's half of my tenon length. I'm going to drill me a little hole, little hole, little hole. And you know what I'm going to peg it with? I'm going to snip the end and I'm going to peg it with a toothpick. Works great. Now, odds are I probably wouldn't need to do that with the modern day adhesives. But it's just something I do. Once I've sanded that smooth and I do my finishing, you're never going to know it's there. That's the clamp rack clamp rack, I'm sorry. That's the quilt rack. Very simple build, very easy to do. And like I said, we've sold a ton of them. People really like them. Again, it has a really nice contemporary flair to it. It has a really nice traditional flair to it. Works in either environment. Now, a couple things. I've seen some guys who copied mine, or copied this one, and I've seen them take the stretchers and instead of rounding it over, I've seen them take it and use a, cut it square, and use a 45 degree chamfer bit on all four side on the four sharp sides. Gives it an octagon look. Looks good. Makes a nice stretcher. Adds another dimension to it. I prefer the round look. Very simple. Now we're ready to finish it up. As soon as the glue dries, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick my little pegs in, sand it, double check my sanding. I'm ready to finish. Okay, we're done. Here's the cherry one. And what we wanted in it in a color was we wanted it to look like aged cherry little bit. We didn't want it real dark or nothing. And that's not easy to do when you've got sapwood. By using a layered finish, it was a piece of cake. We were able to get it with no issues whatsoever. I'll show you. You can get a kind of a look. Remember all that sapwood was on the outside? You never know it was there. 
And then, here's our poplar one. And as promised, it looks like a beautiful, nice, rich walnut. Again, using a layered finish. This one, because we wanted something you could do at home, we did a nice oil finish on. This one, we continued right on with, with the gel finish and came out just beautiful. Looks just like walnut. You'd be real hard pressed to ever tell the difference. The other thing with this on the cherry is that the finishing schedule that we use, this will stay this color. It's not going to change with age because we've got the actual wood is sealed in. So it just worked. Rub it out a little bit, throw a little wax on it. They feel like warm butter. That's what a finish should feel like. I hope you've enjoyed the quilt rack and I hope you've learned something. Now before I leave, I want to tell you something that I may didn't and I don't think I did. If you're using the tenon cutter, works wonderful. One of the things you want to be careful with is that as you come down, where it meets the shoulder, be very careful because if you keep going, it's going to actually keep cutting and it can actually damage your shoulder right here that you've already made using the dado blade on the table saw. So what I usually do is actually just cut it down pretty close, stop and take a little knife or a chisel or whatever and just finish out my little corner right next to the shoulder. Shenandoah Valley Quilt Rack. Simple, easy, and it's always been a big hit with our customers. Now I want to say one last thing. If you're watching these, you're going to find that some of our DVDs and some of our videos kind of get to be a little bit long. And I don't apologize for that. Because a lot of you out there are novices. Some of you are just beginning. So to cut the corners and leave anything out, well, I just don't think it's a good idea. If you're going to show it, show the whole shooting match. And so we try to. So if you're to this point, you've watched a lot of video. I hope you found it informative. I'm Charles Neal. Catch you later.